Oh, there you go. Hello, everybody. It's Amy Graham here. We will get started here shortly as people are joining. So thanks for joining us today. Look forward to chatting with you this afternoon. And we will wait till everybody joins and then at the top of the hour, get started. Thanks again for sharing your afternoon, or is it still morning for you? Thanks again for sharing your day with me and the rest of the team here at Stroudwater. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Stroudwater, third annual Stroudwater Critical Access Hospital Finance and Operational Virtual Conference. My name is Amy Graham, and I'm going to be chatting with you for probably about the next 45 minutes or so. And then I've got two of my other colleagues that will be joining us to talk about the various topics. Um, just a few housekeeping things to happen. You could be like me and have to turn off your phone as it's ringing. No, it's not a movie theater. You don't need to do that. You can leave your phone still on ring. But if you're hosting and, and leading it, you might want to put it on vibrate. Housekeeping items. Uh, participants will be muted automatically. So if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment, please feel free to send, send it through either the chat or the Q&A. There are two boxes that are on your Zoom menu. You can put that there. All of these sessions are going to be recorded. So because you've registered for the session, you will receive a copy of the recording as well as the slide decks. So just letting you know that after this, I'm going to have such fabulous information. You're going to want to see it again. OK, maybe not me, but Lindsay and Wade, they're coming up next. You'll want their information. Uh, you will get that. And then at the end, there will be a short survey. So we'd appreciate it. If you would go ahead and just complete that survey for us, uh, just a few questions it shouldn't take any time at all for you to answer them, but questions just to get your feedback and uh, help us improve because help us to just know that this is a valuable use of your time, because we know that time is a um, limited resource nowadays for some of us, and we appreciate the fact that you have joined us. So. Um, just to tell you a little bit about Stroudwater. Stroudwater has been working in the rural health market since 1985. So I think if I do the math right, that's about 38 years that we have been in the business. Since 2017, we actually have this chart here that tells you, you know, just where throughout the United States, including Alaska and Hawaii, that we have um, had clients and um, just worked with them, supporting them and their needs that they may have. And then also we have Stroudwater Capital Partners. They are um, just working with different organizations throughout the country as well with some financing options, helping to to um, provide financial sources for initiatives and projects from a capital nature that you may have. And you can see that 
there are 17 different clients out there that they have supported and we're really excited about this venture and working with Stroudwater Capital Partners. Also, in case you've just heard me talk before or one of my colleagues, it's like, what all does Stroudwater do? And we are a full service firm that we provide strategic advisory services as well as operational services. So if you have a friend and you want to call us and be like, hey, I'm looking for some help in this area, feel free to do it because I could have someone that um, is within the firm that is working on that need or supports that area of, um, that you would like to know more about. All right, with that being said, we are gonna talk about price transparency today. Big thumbs up from everybody, <laughs> I know. Um, price transparency, non-compliance, and how to fix it. And so we're gonna start off by really talking about what is price transparency. You may have heard it mentioned out there. You may have seen it in some articles. Um, it's really fascinating that my husband was listening to the radio series XM the other day, and he heard an ad about it. And he's like, I know what that is. Um, so it's out there. So we're going to talk about what that is, if you happen to hear about it. And then um, I'm going to tell you a tale from a small hospital, a critical access hospital, you know, same size as all of you out there that are critical access hospitals with 25 beds and just what they encountered, how they addressed the violation, and then some overall key learnings about it. So with pricing transparency, what is that? Well, back in 2019, CMS, I know, so long ago, right? CMS finalized the um, current year 2020 hospital outpatient PPS policy changes and payment rates and ambulatory surgical center payment system policy changes and payment rates, colon, pricing transparency requirements for hospitals to make standard public. All right, make standard charges public. That CMS 1717-F2. I'm going to call that price transparency, if you don't mind, um, just to save that. But it was legislation that was put into effect as of January 1st of 2021. I know that when it, when it was discussed in 2019 and then we had the pandemic, a lot of questions came out to me like, Amy, are we really going to do this? Is this going into effect? And at the time, I'm like, so far, it seems like it is. I haven't heard that it's not. And it did go into effect. And this price transparency regulation, it is required from all licensed hospitals in the United States. So if you have friends that are running, say, a behavioral health hospital or a children's hospital, they are required to post this information in addition to critical access hospitals and your acute PBS hospitals that are out there. This information it's actually accessible to individuals in two ways. The first way is a comprehensive machine readable file. You know, we used to have to just post our charge master out there and you'd put it on the website. That was one of the requirements. Well, that charge master now needs to be a comprehensive machine readable file. We'll go into that here in a little bit just to tell you what that is. And then the second way it needs to be posted is through a shoppable services file. And it's done in a consumer-friendly uh, consumer format. And what they mean by shoppable services is that these are services that are scheduled in advance. So if um, someone is looking for obstetrics care, if they want to have a CT of their head, these are services that people should be able to shop for that the consumer could go out there and shop to say, how much is this going to cost me? So that is actually required to be out there. And then why am I talking about this? I know I said, you know, it came from way back in 2019, went into effect in 2021. Amy, we are in June of 2023. Why are you bringing this up? Well, the reason is, is because failure to comply will result in civil monetary penalties of $300 per day for hospitals with a bed, bed count of 30 or fewer. So how many beds does your facility have? If it's less than 30, which probably it is, then it's a $300 per day fine and penalty and fine if you do not have this information posted. If you are at a larger facility with more than 30 beds, it's $10 per day, no, per bed 
per day for hospitals with a bed count of greater than 30. And, you know, I said that people are asking me, Amy, is this going to go away? And I'm like, no, it's not going to go away. And they'd be like, Amy, are they going to assess fines? And I'm like, I think they're going to assess fines. And then the answer became, yes, they assessed million dollar fines down for hospitals in Georgia. You can see some uh, news releases about that but they are also now looking at critical access hospitals. And so I have, I have at least six friends that are at critical access hospitals who have received violation notices and that we're gonna talk about one of those and how we made it through today. But this is the reason I'm bringing it up, $300 per day per hospital with a bed count of 30 or fewer is what the penalty is. So let's talk about this. The con comprehensive machine readable file. You know how I mentioned that used to, you would have all your charges posted out there. You just take your charge master, boop, post it, life was grand, you walked away. Well, now you actually have to include all standard charges for all items and services for all locations operating under a single hospital license. So if you have clinics out there that are operating under your hospital license, their information has to be included. It must be posted on a publicly available website. Can't be hidden in your dark web, you know, can't be hidden behind the scenes for your website. It must be publicly available, easily accessible without barriers, meaning that people can find it, they can pull it up, and digitally searchable. It must be updated at least once annually, and it must follow a standard naming convention. Now that's just naming of the file. What the format looks like on the inside of that file is up to the individual hospital. However, it must follow a standard naming convention for that file name. And the data elements that are required to be in this file must have a description of every item. Okay, that's what was on the old file. A discounted cash price. Oh. Discounted cash price, we've got to put that out there. A payer specific negotiated charge. That is the charge that the hospital has negotiated with a third party payer for the shoppable service and for this, this standard charge. That's the information that, that is required to be posted out there. You also then have to have the de-identified minimum negotiated charge and the de-identified maximum negotiated charge. So it's like, what's the lowest amount that you have negotiated a charge for, a reimbursement rate for, and then what's the highest charge? I always found it, found it pretty ironic that they ask for that information to be de-identified but they still ask for you to give the payer specific negotiated rate, meaning that, okay, you give the de-identified minimum and maximum, but then if you look over to the right, it's gonna give you the name of those payers, but okay, that's not me. We gotta follow the rules. So just letting you know, doesn't make sense, but that's the information that they want. And if you don't include that information, you will receive fines. So just keep that in mind when looking at it, okay? This is all the information that has to be on the machine readable file. It's all of the services, including inpatient, outpatient, bed rates, all of those things. Um, so that talks about the comprehensive machine readable file. Now let's talk about the shoppable services file. What is that? I mentioned a minute ago how these are items that you shop for, that you wanna know your doctor has said, you need to have this service done. You can go to the hospital and have it done like cataract surgery and the insert, insertation, is that the right, insert, okay. When you have a lens inserted, <laughs> I stumbled over that word, sorry about that. But when you, the cost of that lens itself, that when you have that lens inserted, what is that cost going to be? That's what's included on this shoppable services file. So there are 70 specified services that are provided by the hospital that are required to be posted. And then the total amount of charges or total amount of services that you must post must equal the number, the equal the total of 300. 
So if you don't provide all 70 CMS services, so you only provide 50 of those CMS specified ones, then you need to find an additional 250 to get to a total of 300. 250 services that you provide in your hospital to be posted in this shoppable services file. Now, what's the difference between the shoppable services file, excluding the 70, the 300 shoppable services and your full CDM? Well, it's limited to 300, but it also includes any ancillary services connected with those 300 shoppable services. So take, for example, one of the CMS specified services is a colonoscopy. Well, with the colonoscopy, if you think about when that procedure is done, you have an anesthesia charge, you may have a, um, a surgeon charge, there may also be a pathology charge. Those items, if it is covered by your facility, have to be, or those items, whether or not they're provided by your facility, have to be listed on this shoppable services file. And so if, you know, your hospital does not provide it, but there is a physician, an anesthesiologist, who's going to bill for that on their own, that information has to be included with that colonoscopy. Or let's think about it a different way, that you have a, um, that you have a CT with contrast. Well, when you include the ancillary charges, you put the CT of the head with contrast, and then you also have to have a separate line item that says here is the charge for the contrast that the hospital will charge. So this information has to be posted on your shoppable services file connected to that individual line item that is out there. Again, like the comprehensive machine readable file, it must include all locations operating under your single license. It must be publicly posted easily accessible without barriers and then when that and you know that you're not supposed easily accessible without barriers that you can digitally search it it's updated at least once annually and they do provide an option CMS did provide an option to where you could have a patient estimator tool used instead of providing a file out there. So if your hospital has um, here, you can go and see what your charges are, put in your information. That information can come, that is an approved option for how to post these shoppable services. Now, within that shoppable service file, the elements that must be included are a description of each item and the ancillary services connected with that identified service. So they have to be there. An indicator of CMS specified services that are not offered. So those 20 that your hospital doesn't offer, you've got to say, hey, we recognize we're supposed to include it on the list, but we do not offer that. And then you also include a discounted cash price, payer specific negotiated rate, de-identified minimum, de-identified maximum, and report that for all of the items, all the um, ancillary services, as well as a, the main shoppable service that you've identified. So that needs to be on the file. So that give you a little background on that. Well, you know how we mentioned the fines just a minute ago and how they were gonna levy these fines of $300 per day? Well, CMS recently, as recently as April 26th of this year, strengthened its enforcement of this hospital transparency rule, saying that there are stricter timelines for getting this put up and that the fines are going to be levied more quickly. So that process, how does that process go about? Well, you get a notice of violation. The first step is a notice of violation comes from CMS to the CEO of your hospital. So it's it's going to go make it to your CEO. So if you're in revenue cycle or if you're in IT or um, a CFO, just know that your CEO may get a notice of violation if you are found not to be in compliance. And on that notice of violation, you have 90 days with which to remediate it. So you got 90 days to get it fixed. And then if you don't get it fixed, they're going to send you another notice to your CEO that says, you now must submit a corrective action plan. That corrective action plan 
you must return that collective action plan back to CMS within 45 days. And it must say that you have 90 days to be in full compliance. So if you think about this timeline, you got 90 days to get through the violation and then another night and then 45 days after that, you must have your corrective action plan fixed. And then hospitals not making any attempt to satisfy the requirement, i.e. CMS goes out there and looks and they can't find anything out there for your hospital, they don't even get a notice of violation. They, they do not pass go, they do not collect $200 they go straight to corrective action plan. Um, I do have one of my friends that that happened to them, that their files were posted out there, but they weren't in the right naming convention. And because of that, CMS skipped straight to the corrective action plan and said that you, you know, we're no longer going to give you a warning notice. You have 45 days to submit our corrective action plan and 90 days to be in full compliance. And so just letting you know that there is that process out there for what to expect regarding the fines and levies of penalties. Now, said all that, just to help you know, though, that I've been through this. I've got a tale of a small hospital. And this is one, like I said, I've got five friends, five to six friends who are at critical access hospitals who have gone through this. Um, but Allegheny Health is one, and the folks at Allegheny gave me permission to use them to uh, share that they did experience this situation. They are a 25-bed critical access hospital in Sparta, North Carolina. And they were actually posting their shoppable services using a free tool out there. That when they talked to me, they're like, Amy, we had this tool, but you know what? We struggled to really find 300 unique shoppable services. We don't offer all 70 that were required by CMS, but you know, we're a small hospital. We have limited patient volumes. We have limited services. How are we ever gonna do this? And they got a note from CMS, they had a lovely letter that went to their administrator that said they received a warning notice that they were non-compliant with the violations. And now, let me tell you a little bit more about these violations. As per the legislation, CMS evaluates these hospital compliance using several different methodologies. The one being that they go out and look at the hospital websites, okay? Second one being that they evaluate complaints that are made to CMS. So somebody could call CMS and just go, mm, this hospital isn't participating. Or they review individuals or entities analysis of non-compliance. So there may be entities that are going out there to see if hospitals are compliant or not. And CMS takes this information and they, they evaluate whether or not a hospital is in compliance. And so with Allegheny, they received a notice on a Tuesday in November, it was right after Thanksgiving, Tuesday in November stating that the hospital's website, a review of their website had occurred on the previous Wednesday. So the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, somebody went out and looked at their website and said they are not in compliance. And by that following Tuesday, they got a note in the mail. And they, the, when this note came in, it actually did have the specific violations listed out. So it said, here's your violation on your comprehensive machine readable file. Your violation could not find it. And then they also received a violation related to the displaying of the shoppable services, specifically that no consumer friendly list of standard charges was found. So the note, when you get it, actually does tell you what CMS finds to be in violation. And then they were given 90 calendar days to remediate the violation. So when this happened, <laughs> you know, I don't know about you, but for me, when I got the call from him, it was like immediate concern. And I could hear the concern in the voice because the first question is, who can help us remediate this issue? Amy, we've got a problem. I've got this letter. What do I do about this letter? I, I need help. And then the other question that came up was, okay, I got to get this done in 90 days. Do they not know Christmas is coming? New Year's, we're in the holidays. What's going on here? 90 days to, might not be enough time to complete this project that I've got to get done because it's the violation. And then the other thought is, how much is this going to cost to get this in compliance? What's this remediation going to cost? 
but then in addition to what's this remediation going to cost, what's the fine going to be if we don't comply? And, you know, we're a small critical access hospital in Sparta, North Carolina. $300 a day fine is a substantial fine. I mean, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars over the year. So not complying is not an option, but how much is that remediation going to cost us? So we went into how are we going to address this violation? Because I don't know about you, but violation notices are scary. So the first step that they did was they reached out to a partner that was familiar with their facilities pricing transparency. We had already, with their facility and pricing transparency, so I had already been working with Allegheny on reviewing their charge master and helping them uh, work through some charge masters. We had worked on some other projects together where I understood about their rural health clinic, just different things related to it. So they reached out and they're like, hey, here's my facility. You know us. Do you know somebody that can help with pricing transparency? I'm like, yep, I gotcha. I can help you out. And then also what we did is we connected with the Office of Rural Health in the state of North Carolina to see if they had any resources that could help with um, funding that remediation plan. Because, you know, there, there are some challenges there and how much is this going to cost and, you know, can they do that? And so the Office of Rural Health partnered with Allegheny to help them through this process. They formed an internal task force to support the project. So even though we were going through a holiday, um, the holiday season that they, had a task force, they knew that was their job, they knew the, the financial impact related to it. And then they also had to step back and realize that one size fits, fits most model, that free service that they had, that, you know, hey, use our service, that it didn't fit their needs. That by using ERA files that were coming back and looking at the volumes, they didn't have enough volumes to generate the information that needed to be in that one size fits most model. And so we started immediately working on a compliant offering, looking at here is their information, this is the information we needed to pull and putting it together. So with that, we created the offering. And when I say we, it was um, myself working with the hospital team to create both the shoppable services offering and the comprehensive machine readable file. So one of the first things we did is we worked together to identify 300 total services that could be included on that list for the hospital and clinic charge masters. So we pulled that information together we worked with the clinical teams then to get them engaged to say, okay, if you do a CT with contrast, what type of contrast do you use? Who charges, is there a professional fee associated with that? What does that look like? And pulling that information so that we could include it on their shoppable services piece. Then, we, while all of this was going on, we were analyzing payer contracts. Do they have a copy? I don't know about you, but do you have a copy of your most recent payer contract that is out there? Do you know what those negotiated rates are? We had to go and pull that information and develop it because, you know, that wasn't something they just had lying around. So we were pulling the hospital contracts with the payer, the payer contracts to make sure that we could identify the rates, getting the rates loaded. And then we developed an Excel model to say, here's what, you know, here's what we can post out there on the Allegheny website. Now, in the comprehensive machine readable file, we were able to leverage some of the information that we pulled in the shoppable services listing. However, we, you know, with the comprehensive machine readable file, it's going to be the entire charge master, not just that portion of those 300 tests, but that entire charge master. And the nice thing was we didn't have to identify the associated ancillary charges because those would have been listed specific, listed separately. We did use payer specific negotiated information. So when we pulled that contract, we used that calculation, those numbers for the project with the comprehensive machine readable file. Got both of those. And then we developed a CSV file to post on the Allegheny website. And the great thing was that we were able to complete and post both of these files online in under 60 days from the date of notification. 
like, yay, we were celebrating, you know, it was like, we made it through, we got it, even in all of the holidays and all of the challenges that we were facing, we were able to get all of this completed in under 60 days from the date of notification. And then what happened? Then we waited. We waited for the Stealth Ninjas to return. We tried, I mean, I remember when we walked into it, we're like, well, who do we tell that we've posted it? We've got it done. Do we tell somebody? And there's nobody to tell. You wait. You put it all out there on the website and you hope for the best and wait for the Stealth Ninjas to return and review your data. They do it. And then you wait to see if you've passed or not. And March 2023, 20, 90 days from the first notice, CMS performed a second review of the Allegheny website and determined that they were non-compliant. Oh my goodness. The violations that were found were that we did not include any room and board charges. Unfortunately, those lines had been left off. We don't know how that happened, but it did. And then remember when I told you about the naming convention, they got on to us about the naming convention. They, the violation was found that we failed to follow the naming convention specified by CMS, where it was the EIN underscore hospital name underscore standard charges dot CSV is what it was. So we had to use the NBI number. We thought, use the NBI number. That's how you refer to us everywhere else. No, use the tax ID. No, they want the employer identification number. So keep that in mind if you take anything away. Remember, standard naming convention. There were no violations on the shoppable services file, so that was fabulous. But there were on that comprehensive machine readable file. And then the, we were given 45 days to provide, 45 days to complete the corrective action plan, meaning that you had to fill out their form. So CMS actually gave you a form that said, Here's the violation. Here's how we're going to remediate it. This is the data. We're going to remediate it. It will be completed by this day. Remember I said you have to have 90 days. It must be completed. That corrective action plan must be um, completed and all remediation done within 90 days. It asks you for the date that you will have this done. And so it was a naming. So we just take, took file, added the three lines for the room and board, changed the name, saved it. And we, resub we submitted that corrective action plan within three days. And then you know what happened? We waited on the Stealth Ninjas again because there's nobody to communicate with. It is one of the most tenuous yet frustrating yet, well, isn't that ironic, <laughs> situations that you have nobody to talk to. And then even if you do talk to somebody, you've got to wait until they go back and do review it within 30 days and then they will issue a, you a compliance notice. So with issuing you that compliance notice, you do get it back. So at the end of the day, you know that you are in compliance with it. With that, we have some key learnings. One of the key learnings that, and I, I tell you, if you talk to me for any length of time, you're going to hear me talk about pricing transparency because a key learning is, it's not just for the larger institutions. It's not for the Mayo Clinics. It's not for all of the big bad boys out there. It's, you know, that when you think about it, it is for your rural and critical access hospitals. They are not exempt and they are paying attention. I know I've told you five, right? Five, five of my friends, maybe six, have received violation notices. Some of them have been for something as simple as they didn't review it within the past 12 months. They had a file posted out there. It was dated January 1st of 2022. It was reviewed in April. They received a violation notice because they had not looked at it within the past 12 months. Key learning, keep in mind that a comprehensive machine readable file and the shoppable services file contain similar yet unique information. They are two different but same things. So you can't just post the same file twice. You must post this information that they are looking for. Another key learning is that while CMS provides flexibility in the format of your file, the format, you can do it however you choose to do it as long as you have the key elements included. 
But remember, incorrect file name convention and the omission of the last date review will cause a violation. Save yourself the angst. Go back, look at your offering, make sure you have a date up out there that is within the past 12 months and make sure that it is named correctly. And then the last key learning is resources are available to provide support. You don't have to go through this alone. So if you get one of those letters, if, you're, if your CEO gets one of those letters and they call you up and they're like, hey, man, why do I do it? You know, call me. I, I, will, I will go look at your offering and, and help you out and share with you what I see that is in violation. Read it. Realize that you don't have to go through this alone that you it is there are resources to help you solve this and any challenges that you may face it is possible to be done and so with that i just want to say you know does do you have any questions for me about this i know that i i'm like pricing transparency it's out there but it really is an important subject and just want to make sure that um, you have access to it and here's my contact information, more than happy to chat with you about it. Um, but again, if you have any questions, feel free to send them through the chat box and I will be more than happy to answer them. The file review process again. All right, so I have a question of repeating the file review process again. So if I go back, let me go pull that slide up again. I think this is the one you are talking about on how CMS looks at the file. That I'm, I'm thinking this is what you are asking about, that what CMS does is they go out and actually review your website. And I will tell you, I don't know if that is a bot that is doing it, if it is a person doing it. Um, they do tell you the date, if you get a violation notice, they do tell you the date they reviewed it, um, but they evaluate it with several methods where they'll go out and audit your website. They will evaluate complaints that are made to CMS and they will review your individual, you know, like if there is an organization, I know there's some organizations that are already out there um, pulling this information and they will go out and look at that as well. I think there are some sites that it's like, hey, report if you've got a, you know, if you don't see pricing transparency information, please feel free to report it to us. Um, I know that there are several, um, several companies out there that are pulling that information and creating databases for it. So, um, so that is the question out there related to it. Uh, but then I would also say, that when you go through this review process, um, and I think just because I think he's so cute, you do have the stealth ninjas. <laughs> that they, when they do it, you don't know they're looking. And so if you receive that violation notice, um, you just sort of go, okay, what's well, 90 days from now? And you know that 90 days from now, they'll come back in and look at it, um, but do it as a ninja in the background working at night, so. Any other questions? And I would say, if you'd like to see what we did, um, you know, you can go to the Allegheny website or feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'd be more than happy to show you uh, what has made it through the CMS review. And when I say I have six friends, um, a lot of the a lot of the requirements that or a lot of the violations that I'm seeing are just related to have they updated it annually? Because when you think about this, it had to go into effect on January 1st of 2021. A lot of us were all in all in compliance as of January 2021. Well, we are now in 2023. And have you looked at that offering in the past 12 months? And is there a date on your file? Because it's some as simple as putting a date on the file to say, here's the last time this file was uploaded and that information out there. So, all right, well, at this point, I'm gonna, I see my colleague Wade is on the phone. Hey, Wade, are you, are you gonna, uh, you there? There you are. Hey, Wade, good hey, to see you today. Your, 
feel like, Amy, you're waving at me. Um, so anyway, Wade is going to jump in now and talk to you about all things cost report. So really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. I will tell you from my perspective, um, just understanding the interaction between the cost report and revenue cycle, the things that you set up on that payer, on that pricing transparency do have an impact on your cost report because if you're changing your prices, it's going to impact what your charges are on that. So look forward to hearing from you, Wade, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Amy. And yes, I, I agree. It's very fun to, to think about the interaction between you know the cost reporting side and the revenue cycle side. Um, there's a lot there. Um, and so it's a great, great to partner with you on that. So um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wade Gallen, and I am a senior consultant here at Stroudwater with a background in finance and reimbursement primarily. Um, so I have the privilege of being able to speak to you all today about cost report, best practices, and opportunities. Um, I, this is a very near and dear topic to um, my heart. I originally came from a Medicare administrative contractor when I uh, was first out of college, one of my first jobs there, and I was out there reviewing cost reports, not really knowing what they were and the implications behind it. And, and it was a really interesting role because you got to look under the hood a bit as to the operations of you know, the Medicare administrative contractors. And so from there, I kind of took that um, knowledge and, and uh, skill set and worked in a number of different other environments on the consulting side, preparing cost reports, and in the provider side as well, doing a lot of cost report preparation and um, helping to estimate those third-party settlements during the year. Um, so a lot of a lot of background in cost reporting, and I'm really excited to jump in here and talk about um, what we consider to be best practices and some of the most important opportunities we see, or one of, some of the most common opportunities. How about that? There we go. Computers cooperating now. So for an agenda, we're going to do a quick, a very quick overview, just of critical access hospital reimbursement, at least from a federal federal perspective. So from the the Medicare side of, of it, then we're going to look at some of the best practices related to you know mostly cost report preparation, but a lot of it ties into cost report review. So we're going to take a look at some of those best practices. And then some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see here at Stroudwater when we work with critical access hospitals to review their cost report and evaluate um, what are some areas that there, there might be additional hiccups in reimbursement for them. So we'll jump into that. The big caveat, of course, here is that, you know, with cost reporting, it's so nuanced and it's impacted by a number of different regulations. There are lots of different calculations that go into a cost report. Um, and there tend to be exceptions to the general rule at times. Um, I remember first, you know, taking the, the CPA exam and studying for the tax section and, you know, took a few tax courses as well. And they would always say, yeah, there's a general rule out there. But in this case, there's an exception to that. And there was always an exception to the general rule. And I found that in cost reporting, especially in preparation, um, there's certainly some of those caveats and those nuances that we need to consider. So as an overview of critical access hospital reimbursement, um, we're starting off here just to set the stage and understand why the Medicare cost report is important for critical access hospitals. I'm sure a number of you on the call are very well aware of how important they are, but just wanted to hit on that a little bit more. Um, critical access hospitals receive cost-based reimbursement uh, for inpatient and outpatient services in, from Medicare. And in some states, they also receive cost-based reimbursement from Medicaid. So any of the Medicare, traditional Medicare and Medicaid patients, that, that cost-based reimbursement comes into play. So what does cost-based reimbursement do? Um, it is a mechanism by which hospitals can be partially, and I put partially there in bold and italicized it because it truly is partial insulation from some of the financial impacts of significant volume fluctuations that occur. This is because if you're paid based on your cost, you have um, you receive similar type of reimbursement. So if your volumes suddenly decrease a substantial amount, but your cost structure remains largely intact, you will see an increase in your cost base rate. 
because it's based on costs to somewhat offset those volume declines. Another thing that cost-based reimbursement does is it provides a little bit of an advantage from a capital planning perspective. And the reason I say that is because when we're looking at you know, capital projects, there's generally a significant amount of depreciation that comes with that. And with that depreciation being truly a non-cash expense that can be claimed in many cases as allowable costs on your Medicare cost report, it actually can help bolster some of the cash flows as you work through that. So it provides an advantage that might not be there for um, a hospital that's reimbursed on a non-cost base basis. And it, it helps, again, to my initial point, it can help hospitals operate in communities where there's inherently low populations. This is why critical access hospitals are, are in the rural areas, right? So they help, they help to offset some of those impacts. Now, cost-based reimbursement does not protect a hospital from all their financial woes, and it doesn't negate the need to uh, maintain prudent cost management strategies. It's not like you can go out and just start increasing your costs and say, well, Medicare is going to reimburse it all because that's not how it works, unfortunately. Um, but it, it is a mechanism to help hospitals who, um, who have that. So the Medicare cost report and why it's important is because it helps set the rates for um, your, it helps set your rates going forward. So when you file your Medicare cost report with your Medicare administrative contractor, they will perform some preliminary reviews and they'll either accept or reject your cost report. But if they accept it, then they're going to utilize that in developing your rates. So they'll call it an interim rate, which they're going to pay you for uh, for a specified period of time, um, generally until you file another acceptable cost report and they choose to issue a, a rate review for that. Um, but it's really important that we think about how to maximize our Medicare cost report because it is really the driver for, for that reimbursement um, from Medicare and for, for some hospitals in states where Medicaid is cost-based, it helps as well. So it's very important, it's very important. With that said, I wanna go through some of the best practices that we see here. The list that you're seeing right now, we have you know, mappings, overhead cost allocations, the, the settlement and tracking that throughout the year, and then cost port reviews. These are not mutually exclusive and they're also not meant to be a panacea. So these are not, this is not supposed to be all of the best practices in cost report um, preparation and maintenance. These are meant to be high level uh, groupings of best practices that, that I've seen over, over my career and that we've seen here at Stroud Water in reviewing cost reports. So if we could kind of take them and, and bucket them into um, significant buckets, this would be where we would, we would put some of those. So we'll go through each of these. Um, expense and revenue mappings, right? So when we're preparing our Medicare cost report, there is this idea of the matching principle. And the matching principle says that if we have expenses and revenues, they need to be aligned within a cost center. So the Medicare cost report will break everything out by cost center. And you need to make sure that you're appropriately matching the expenses incurred with the revenue produced. Um, and this would relate to your revenue generating departments. Um, we'll touch on overhead departments in the next slide. But, but generally speaking, we wanna ensure that we are adhering to this matching principle. Um, and so what's the, what's the issue if we do not uh, do this, if we're not properly matching revenues and expenses? Um, the long story short is it can really materially impact our rates that we're receiving from Medicare. There is a, a significant chance that your Medicare cost to charge ratios, this is just your um, fully, fully allocated cost for a given department divided by your gross charges for that department, excluding professional fees. There is a, um, it's very likely that those can become inaccurate and then overall reimbursement can be misstated because you're using this cost to charge ratio, which then gets applied to your Medicare charges to come up with a cost, an allowable cost that Medicare will reimburse for. So it's really important that we need to ensure that we're mapping expenses and revenues appropriately. Generally speaking, when hospitals are preparing their cost reports, they utilize a trial balance. Sometimes they'll have you know, detailed revenue files that break things down at the revenue code or potentially the charge code level. 
Um, and most of the hospitals that we see um, use the Medicare PSNR to report their Medicare uh, information. So Medicare days and discharges and, and charges, they'll utilize the Medicare cost report for this. I have seen a few hospitals that have chose to use internal information um, due to some billing challenges that they faced with, with making sure that accurate information was on the Medicare PSNR. And I've even had hospitals that have disputed the Medicare PSNR. But generally speaking, we're utilizing the Medicare PSNR, the Provider Statistical and Reimbursement Report, to, to map out our Medicare um, charges. So the best practice is really to be reviewing these mappings on at least an annual basis. Um, what's going to impact these, right? So if we are adding um, departments to our trial balance, if we're adding things to our general ledger, that's going to change. Um, that's going to change the overall structure that we're going to need to report on when Medicare cost reports are due. Um, so this is a really important thing to be monitoring, not just at the end of the year when the cost report is due and you know you you get your trial balance together and start mapping things out. It's really important to monitor this throughout the year, and this will get to a later best practice on cost report reviews. You'll be able to see generally if there are issues in your mappings when you start uh, picking apart you know, the, the cost report as a whole, and you're starting to look into that settlement that we're seeing. Again, this is a big one. It's pretty basic. Um, many people who prepare cost reports will, will um, they, they know this, they kind of know know how to do this and they'll do this in their sleep. But it can be um, it can be very challenging, especially when we consider where different um, items are being booked uh, on the GL. It, it can be a challenge. And so it's something we really need to be aware of. The other best practice that we see is really evaluating our overhead cost allocations. So on the cost report, as many who have worked with the cost report know you have these overhead cost centers, which contain things like your administrative costs. So the cost for departments like accounting, or you'll have your information systems department, or you'll have your dietary, your cafeteria, some of these other overhead cost centers, again, to use cost report lingo. And the Medicare cost report requires you to allocate these overhead cost centers to the other non-overhead cost centers on your cost report. So these would be the patient care departments and in some cases your non-reimbursable cost centers. And so when you are allocating these costs, again, the, the implications are, are significant. Um, if your overhead cost allocations are not accurately reflecting the overhead resource use by department, then you can really skew your Medicare cost to charge ratios, your uh, Medicare per diem, which is used on your inpatient side. Um, you can really start to uh, drastically impact some of these, these areas of the cost report that dictate your reimbursement. Um, so Medicare has, and this is what we often hear when working with hospitals, Medicare has prescribed cost allocation methodologies that they implement. So if you go to your worksheet B-1 on the Medicare cost report where these cost allocations take place, you'll see that, you know, for capital costs, the prescribed, you know, method is generally square footage. So you would take the square footage in each of the departments of your hospital and you would allocate your capital costs such as depreciation based on that square footage. So there are certain prescribed cost allocation methods that are utilized. However, there is an opportunity in some cases for a hospital to request a change in the way they are allocating their overhead costs. Now, why is this important? Well, we generally find that there are um, times in which the overhead cost allocation methodologies being used by critical access hospitals have nothing to do with the way the overhead is used within the hospital. It has nothing to do with, with the way the actual, if, if you were doing a true cost allocation, and if you were to think through it critically and figure out, you know, this is the proper way to, to allocate these overhead costs. A lot of the times a cost report doesn't reflect this 
method. And again, as we talked about before, because that can impact your rates, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, you have to do analysis, but it's really important um, to, to review this. It's a, a big, big issue. And you have the opportunity to work with your Medicare administrative contractor in some cases to adjust these cost allocation methodologies. Um, and so what do we do with that? Well, we really wanna make sure we're reviewing our cost allocations at least annually. Again, if you're filing interim cost reports and you're doing you know, um, cost reporting throughout the year to kind of monitor your settlement as we'll talk about in a minute here, it's really important that you review these on a consistent basis because anything can change in your departmental structure. You can have you know, an additional unit brought onto the, the hospital if you just go through a renovation or if you, um, you know, adjusted certain space, if you moved one department from, from here to there. And there can be any number of things that change um, the overhead cost allocations that occur. And so we just need to be we need to make sure we're reviewing this on a consistent basis. The next best, best practice is really tracking the settlement and this flows in some ways from the previous two best practices, but um, you know, one of the things we check for with our, the hospitals that we help with the cost report is whether or not they were expecting the settlement that they received or that they had to pay back to Medicare at the end of the year. Um, it's often found that, you know, Critical access hospitals and, and other hospitals don't really have a good handle on that. And that can create a number of different issues. So you could be stuck with a significant payable back to Medicare at the end of the year, or you are accruing this significant receivable from Medicare where those funds could have been used earlier had you known about it and then submitted an interim cost report. And you also could have submitted it to your Medicare Advantage payers so that they would, you would get the enhanced rate there. Um, there's any number of issues that can come from that. But again, as, as we state here, uh, critical access hospital settlements are a moving target and they require frequent monitoring to make sure that you don't have any surprises at, at year end. Additionally, as I, I touched on a little bit, Medicare Advantage plans, unlike traditional Medicare, will not true up generally at the end of your fiscal year. So the Medicare traditional side of things, when you file your Medicare cost report, it, it trues up. You either will end up owing money to Medicare or you'll end up receiving money from Medicare, very similar to a tax return, right? Medicare Advantage plans don't necessarily always take that approach. And so it's really important for us to be monitoring um, our rates and our settlements throughout the year. And if it if we experience a significant change in our cost structure and it's advantageous to do, do so, we should consider filing those cost reports to get an enhanced rate. The best practice here is really just making sure that we're monitoring this throughout the year. There are plenty of different models out there, I would say. You can do something internally. You can develop a cost report type model that's meant to mirror or, or mimic the calculations on the cost report. There are a number of um, providers out there who give um, an estimator tool of some kind, and there's a number of tools available for that. But it's really important, no matter how you do it, that you have some sort of developed model that you trust and that can help you accurately predict, you know, what is our settlement going to be at the end of the year um, and, and really monitoring that. And then the last one here that we have is, again, feeding off of the others. These are not all mutually exclusive, really reviewing the cost report. So we've reviewed our, our mappings on a consistent basis. We have the cost allocation methodologies in place. We feel like they're reasonable and accurate. Um, the issue, though, is that the cost report is incredibly complex. There's at least hundreds of calculations that are required, and I, I should go back and actually look at the number of, of calculations in the Medicare cost report. I haven't ticked and tied each one, but there might be thousands that occur. And when you're preparing the cost report, there's so many regulatory references. If you go to the instructions for a given worksheet, you can be provided with all types of CFR re references and, and, and all types of references to one federal register back in 2000 and, and whatever, right? There's so many different um, documents that you need to reference to be able to understand um, the implications of the cost report and how to accurately prepare it. Um, given this complexity, 
it's really important to uh, ensure that there's a multi-tiered review process. Even if you are the reimbursement guru, if you've spent your whole career uh, preparing Medicare cost reports, if you wrote the book on cost-based reimbursement and you have it all figured out, it's still really important to get another perspective because oftentimes we will be, you know, the, the folks who are preparing the cost reports, right? You're in the weeds a little bit. You're kind of in there. You've had, you know, different ways of, of doing things for a while and, and getting somebody outside of that, uh, that weedy perspective um, is really helpful. Uh, and it's important to do this um, before filing your Medicare cost report. I know it's challenging, right? So you have, generally speaking, five months after your fiscal year end to file a Medicare cost report. And it's incredibly complex and it feeds off of multiple documents internally. And you have to work with other departments to get the information you need to prepare it. It is a bear, absolutely. And that all the more stresses the need to have a multi-tiered review process in place before we actually file the cost reports. Um, and we also believe that it's important to get an objective perspective, even post cost report filing, um, which is generally, you know, that's where Stroudwater generally assists is kind of looking at things post filing to understand are there any opportunities here. Um, there are lots of different, uh, well, I, I shouldn't say there are lots, but there are different programs that will help you in your cost report preparation, and they will help mitigate some of the errors to an extent, but it's more designed to make sure that, you know, the calculations are tracking accurately and you're making sure you're reporting things in the correct fiscal period. They're not really looking for opportunities for reimbursement improvement. And so this is why it's incredibly important that we have this multi-tiered review process in place. And I just received a question around the settlement tool. So there was a question posed regarding the settlement tool estimators and where they can be found. Um, I would say you should definitely check in with your cost report preparer if you utilize one. Um, they can generally direct you to a, uh, a settlement tool, tool estimator. Um, as I mentioned before, you can build one internally based on the mechanics of the Medicare cost report and even receive assistance from um, perhaps an outside source um, to help you develop that. But there, there are certainly options available out there. Um, and so there, there are plenty of those and hopefully that, that helps. I don't have a, a specific website where you will find that one cost report estimator tool, but if you're able to work with your Medicare cost report preparers, they generally have access to or can put you in the right direction of an estimator tool to use throughout the year. So great question. And again, just for, uh, this was something I put in here because I thought it was um, interesting. And so this is saying that um, this is a settlement page of the Medicare cost report. So I'll back up and say, this is your settlement summary. At the end of the day, when you've input all the other worksheets and made sure every all your I's were dotted, be produced is an estimate of whether you owe Medicare money or whether Medicare owes you money as a hospital. Um, and they put a, a nice little, so you are signing off on this Medicare cost report as the preparer. You are attesting to the accuracy of the cost report. Again, a reason for ensuring that we're getting this multi-tiered estimate. It takes about 674 hours for a Medicare cost report to be prepared. And if you've been on that preparation side, And my apologies, it appears that I cut out there for a second. Let me share my screen here. Hey, Amy, can you still hear me all right? Or Lindsay or anybody? Yes, you're good. 
Okay, great. Thanks, Wayne. My apologies, everybody. I don't know what happened there. Um, so as, as I was saying, you know, this is just a, a further further um, encouragement to ensure that we're getting those cost report reviewed in objective perspective, multi-tiered review um, before we're filing and even post-filing. All right, so we've covered the best practices. Now we're gonna jump into some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see here at Stroudwater when we're working with our uh, critical access hospitals and other rural hospitals. Here are the five. I, I chose five because five seems like a, a nice uh, number for this type of presentation. You could go on and on about really each of these items and we're only gonna hit on them at a high level. Um, but that being said, if you want to talk more specifically about any of these, I'd be happy to. I could talk cost reports all day, and thank goodness for everybody here that I'm not going to do that, um, but we'll jump in here with Medicare bad debts. All right, so the, the general principle for starting off and understanding what Medicare bad debts are. So they are deductible and coinsurance. These are patient responsibility amounts for traditional Medicare patients that have not been paid. And if you look in the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR, you'll see that the costs attributable to the deductible and coinsurance amounts that remain unpaid are included in allowable costs. You can include those in allowable costs. You have to meet a number of different criteria in order to claim these Medicare bad debts, um, you know, reasonable collection effort. They define that further in regulation you have to have a debt that was actually uncollectible and claimed as uncollectible. I know it seems like a minor distinction there, but it's really important that we are claiming the bad debts in the year in which they were actually uncollectible. Believe it or not, it happens a lot where the, there's a mismatch there and you can have Medicare bad debts disallowed very easily because of it. Um, your critical access hospitals, other rural hospitals are generally uh, utilizing collection agencies to some extent to help collect on not just Medicare bad debts, but all types of bad debts. So claiming these requires us to bring those back. Um, there has to be sound business judgment, and this doesn't include professional services, right? So the Medicare cost report is, is focused on that hospital piece. But So we have all these, these different rules, but at the end of the day, Medicare has said that they will reimburse you for the unpaid portion of that patient responsibility. Now, the opportunity we see is that hospitals are either not tracking Medicare bad debts at all, or they're not tracking them to their fullest extent. Um, so Medicare has said they're gonna reimburse you 65% of the total allowable Medicare bad debts on your cost report. Now, where, where hospitals will get into issues is you know, the period in which they're claiming the bad debts can be a little bit off. Um, they might um, send their bad debts to a collection agency after a certain point in time and then not have that uh, bad debt returned from the collection agency. That's become a bigger and bigger issue for a Medicare reimbursement perspective. Um, you know, maintaining adequate documentation. So, um, generally, and I'm trying to put on my, you know, old Medicare administrative contractor hat, you know, bad debts were one of the areas that um, I reviewed extensively quite a bit. Um, many providers had their Medicare bad debts reviewed because we had seen an escalation in Medicare bad debts claimed on the cost reports. So that became a focus for, for the, the MAC that I was working with. Um, we often found that there was just not adequate documentation. It was kind of, uh, there, there was very little standardization across organizations and um, even some very basic documentation was really hard to, to come up with. Um, so that's a huge issue. That's, a, that's an area that might cause a hospital to not claim a bad debt. Um, and then there's even something as simple as, you know, Medicare has a prescribed format or a recommended format um, that they request that providers uh, submit their Medicare bad debts in, in that format, right? So there's a listing format. You have to itemize your Medicare bad debts. And oftentimes providers just would not follow that prescribed format. And that could result in a in disallowance of Medicare bad debt. So there's a number of different reasons for it, but 
the, the opportunity that we generally see, we try and look for somewhere in the ballpark of about 10% of your total patient responsibility for Medicare, so your total deductible and coinsurance amounts to be claimed on the Medicare cost report. It's not that, that if you have less than that, that doesn't mean that you file things incorrectly. It doesn't mean that if you had a greater percentage that you filed things incorrectly. What it means is that you know, you are outside of what we generally see for that. Um, just to give you an idea, so this is the E-3 Part 5, where you would claim your inpatient Medicare bad debts. And again, line 25 represents your allowable total bad debts. And then on line 26, this is where you would, the, the cost report calculates it, but you would multiply your amount on line 25 by 65% to come up with your adjusted reimbursable bad debts. And that is the total that Medicare will be reimbursing you as a critical access hospital on. And then you also have to report your uh, Medicare bad debts that for patients who are considered dual eligible, which means that they qualify for both Medicare and Medicaid. And there's a whole separate process for auditing those bad debts. Um, but those are included in the total in line 25. Um, so line 27 is included in line 25, but you still have to separately note them. And then line 26 represents the total bad debts multiplied by 65%, which is what you would be reimbursed on, again, if you stand the test of audit. This is sharing where you would find these on the outpatient side, again, E part B, similar structure to what's reported on the, the inpatient side. So what's the solution here? We really need to make sure that we're tracking our bad debts accurately, um, that we are keeping them in the prescribed format, that we're maintaining proper documentation. If we do send um, claims over to collection agencies, we're making sure that those are pulled back prior to claiming these bad debts. Um, there's, there's really a whole host of things to consider as you're claiming these, and they can provide a great reimbursement opportunity for a hospital, but it's becoming um, more and more challenging to receive full reimbursement from these. So it's just really important to, to track these consistently. And again, work with your cost report preparer, who I'm sure will be able to help you through this process. Overhead cost allocations. Again, a huge area of opportunity. We often see this as an opportunity when we review Medicare cost reports. So the general principle, as I've already touched on a little bit earlier, is that we're required to allocate our overhead costs to our non-overhead cost centers on the cost report. So it has to be based on, you know, the regulations refer to it as cost finding. Um, the cost finding methodology has to, be, um, has to be in line with what the regulations say. It has to be an improved method of cost finding. And again, when I talk with hospitals, they, they say they use a specific one because that's what CMS prescribes. Um, there are other ways to an approved method um, can be approved by your Medicare administrative contractor and might be different from the one that is kind of a standard for a critical access hospital. So it's important to consider that. You know, there, there are prescribed methods. The opportunity here, though, is that we often find hospitals allocating overhead costs in ways that just don't really pass the smell test. They don't seem to accurately um, allocate costs based on uh, um, how overhead is actually utilized. And so, and, and we often get kind of the feedback of, well, that's just Medicare's prescribed format and, you know, we don't need to worry about that. When in reality, if we, if we want to take a look at these um, allocation methods, if we actually are trying to get to the true use of overhead, we can find that it has a potential to increase reimbursement. So an area where we see this in quite a bit is the medical records overhead cost allocation. Many critical access hospitals and other providers utilize gross charges to allocate medical records cost. Um, this is a prescribed format, again, by CMS, but generally has no correlation with how the medical records department actually spends their time. Um, and what we find is that if you consider addition, uh, alternative methodologies, they can actually increase your reimbursement because you have more costs going to your higher cost-based departments um, and away from some of the, the lower cost-based departments. And there are other issues such as double counting and, you know, if we're direct costing certain things, but then we're also allocating a portion of costs that really shouldn't be allocated and we're double counting, that's an issue. And then if we're excluding 
different statistics. So that way a cost center is not receiving the, alloc the overhead it should, then that's an issue as well. I didn't include worksheet B-1 because anybody who's worked with worksheet B-1 knows that it's a bear to read on a single screen and you need one of those, you know, really wide screens to see the whole thing. Um, but this would be your worksheet B-1, B part one, B part two, that would show how the cost allocation methodologies are playing out. So the solution here, again, reviewing those on an annual basis, ensuring we're not double counting costs um, between our direct costing and our overhead cost allocations. And then again, considering working with your cost report preparer and your local Medicare administrative contractor or MAC to request changes if they're determined to be you know, advantageous, it, it takes some modeling before you can um, say with confidence that a certain methodology will or will not work for you as a critical access hospital. But it's certainly worth looking into, and it's often an area of opportunity that we see. Related party cost allocations. This is becoming more and more relevant to critical access hospitals, um, mostly because we've seen a number of critical access hospitals enter into management agreements with larger systems in the larger cities throughout the country. Um, we're seeing a lot more affiliations of, of smaller critical access hospitals with larger healthcare facilities. And so what um, related party cost allocations are, right? The general principle is, you know, you have certain um, cost that is related to you. You can kind of think of it like an overhead cost allocation where you have a, a system level set of services, right? So if you're receiving um, information technology support from a larger healthcare system, you receive, you know, 0.5 FTE, or maybe you receive um, uh, additional support, you know, help desk support, that type of thing at a system level, that, that cost can be allocated to you as a critical access hospital. And you generally pay a certain, you know, whether it's a management fee or some other intercompany transaction type, um, transaction, you, you have that occurring, right? So the cost report says, we wanna to get to the actual cost of these services, these related party services being provided. So you have to, you have to keep this in mind. Um, we often see this in the form of a home office cost allocation. Um, generally larger systems will file home office cost statements where they will allocate costs to their various affiliates. Um, and so what, where we see the biggest opportunity here is just in significant significant variation of treatment of these related party costs. And there's often kind of a mentality of, oh yeah, well, you know, corporate or the, the healthcare system takes care of all this. And we don't really know how they allocate costs to us on the home office cost statement or, or by some other means. Um, and so we don't really know how to impact reimbursement. But because costs are cost-based reimbursed, any allocation from a home office really can have a significant impact on you because you know you have you have the amount again that you're paying for the given service that's reported as an as an intercompany transaction or, or some other fee, um, and then they're allocating costs to you, and the cost report compares those two and and says, okay, what's the actual cost here? Um, so the solution to this is really to partner with your healthcare system. Um, or the ones who are allocating the cost to make sure that we're, uh, we're, those methodologies are reasonable. Again, we see often critical access hospitals that don't take any part in that. This is just an example. I'm going to fly through this for the sake of time. Um, so we got two more here. The second to last one we have is um, a physician standby time in the emergency department. And it essentially, is so if you have a you know, provider uh, in your ED, and they have, you know, standby time or they have really time not treating patients. That's reported differently from the time they are treating patients on your worksheet A-8-2. And why this is important is your, um, the time associated with more administrative functions or that standby time gets reimbursed on the cost report, whereas the time for providing care to the patient is not reimbursed on the cost report. Um, so what we often find the opportunity being is that hospitals don't uh, underestimate the time providers are, are spending not delivering patient care in the ED. Um, the solution we often find here is that, you know, time studies or some other methodology is helpful when we're doing this. So that way we can 
maximize the allowable cost on our Medicare cost report and get, get reimbursed at a higher, higher rate. Um, we often get pushback, right? If you've tried to implement this, you get pushback from maybe it's the provider side saying, well, are, are you trying to track the downtime, so to speak, so that way you can talk about compensation and all that stuff and, and there can be a negative connotation with it. And the, the challenge that uh, you know I found generally is helping convince providers that we actually, the more we track this accurately, sometimes it can result in even greater reimbursement on the Medicare cost report. And it's not a ding to any provider. Um, so again, an area of opportunity we see here, there's also a number of different electronic um, time tracking methods that you can utilize, software out there, solutions that exist. Um, and again, this is just an example of where you would see it on your worksheet A-8-2. In this case, the provider component represents an administrative time and the professional side represents the patient care time. And the more the provider component, column five is maximized, the greater the reimbursement will be on the Medicare cost report side. Now, because we're running in on two minutes here, um, the provider-based RHCs and reporting. Um, so the provider-based RHCs, right, they're paid on an all, all-inclusive rate for qualified services. Um, the Medicare cost report for those providers calculates a um, an ARR based on productivity amounts. So if you have providers in the RHC who are not exceeding those productivity amounts. What it does is it'll take your total cost in the RHC and then divide it by a, a minimum as opposed to the actual visits in the, in the RHC. So what this does is it creates an issue if you are, if you are falling below the minimum productivity standards on the cost report, you can get dinged on reimbursement. There's a number of ways that uh, hospitals often will um, undercount or miscount their um, their FTEs and or visit counts to include non-RHC type services. And so that's a huge opportunity we see. Um, and again, this is just how it would play out. In this case, you know, we have um, an RHC that's exceeding their minimum productivity uh, standards in terms of visits, um, but sometimes we see the opposite and it can be detrimental. So the solution here is really reviewing our provider FTEs and visit counts for accuracy, making sure we're excluding any non-RHC services in that count as well. So with that, I wanna thank you for your time. I know I'm right there at 420. Um, hey Wade, it's Hillary. We have yeah. one question. Yep. Um, if you don't mind really quick. Um, yeah. So the question that we got was, what are the conditions that need to be met to be compliant for an administrative overhead allocation? Yeah, so, um, Generally speaking, you have to get approval for your MAC. I'm assuming this is referred to, um, referring to the B-1, your administrative A and G cost center. And in that case, you um, you would need to get approval from your MAC. Uh, I would, there's a number of different ways to kind of go about that. Some hospitals, they fragment is what they call it. They fragment their administrative in general and come up with multiple methodologies. Others tend to group it all together, but Maybe there are certain cost centers that get excluded from the allocation. So there's a number of different ways to approach that. But I think the key is really getting approval from your MAC. So hopefully that answers the question. Um, and with that, unless there are any other questions, um, I will turn it over to my colleague, Lindsay, who's going to jump in and talk about health equity strategy. So Lindsay, I will pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Wade. Uh, Moving here. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, again, thanks for joining uh, today's uh, Critical Access Hospital uh, virtual conference with Stradwater. My name is Lindsay Corcoran. I'm a senior consultant at Stradwater Associates. And today we're gonna shift gears a little bit. You know, Wade and Amy really touched on revenue cycle and uh, some cost reporting best practices. And now we're really switching gears and we're going to talk about health equity and really the focus of this is really on the importance of data collection um, and such a, a foundational um, a component of really advancing um, an organization's health equity strategy really relies on data and data collection, data analysis and so forth. So really um, key things that we're going to address and, and try to cover today um, in the in the time that we have remaining is you know, certainly uh, 
rural America, we're, we're really facing a disproportionate social and economic disparities really compared to our urban um, settings. And really it's that time now is to really leverage data at a local level to start to understand and really um, begin to really uncover the healthcare disparities that may be in our communities, in our local service areas, um, within our county level, um, and really to help us really understand where we can start to develop kind of interventions to improve health, to start to minimize and close those gaps related to disparities. Um, we're gonna talk about the importance of health equity and social determinants of health data. And then really appreciating how this data can support uh, your overall health equity strategy. So why is um, health data, health equity data, why does it matter? Um, certainly, if we do not measure um, and look at health and health care data, uh, any type of disparity that exists really won't, you know, we won't be able to uncover it. We won't be able to notice it. Um, and as we are moving so rapidly in healthcare, trying to kind of chase uh, various things related to improving healthcare, uh, we likely may oversee something. We might not recognize, you know, a disparity that's existing within our community. So if we measure it, we're, we're more likely to uncover uh, a disparity that's existing in our communities. Uh, another thing that we need to start to think about is how we stratify or how do we differentiate the healthcare data that we're looking at. And it's not just uh, we're going to look at some data, but we're going to start to kind of uncover, we're going to look a little bit deeper into that data. And we're going to start to look at it from a race or ethnicity standpoint. Um, we're going to incorporate language and other demographic factors into our data. Um, and that, you know, in taking it in, in starting to stratify and differentiate our data, we really, it, it's it's really uncovering and very important to do that, to be able to understand and, and look at some of those disparities in that magnitude there. Um, we often underestimate um, those the disparities that are existing in our own patient populations. So unless we don't, if, unless we look at the data, the maybe the, the gap in which or the magnitude can be very large. Um, and so we might not be aware of some of those barriers that our patients and our patient population is really experiencing. Um, and certainly uh, look uh, examining, stratifying, um, quality and health outcome data is really the most reliable way to really look at that magnitude of disparity and start to uh, use that data to implement strategies, interventions, allocate necessary resources accordingly to support your health equity strategy and initiatives. We know, and, and likely many of you have heard that CMS is certainly all in. So certainly from the federal aspect, um, health equity is, is a huge component of some of the initiatives that at the federal level um, and a lot of our state level partners are really highlighting health equity and bringing it really to the forefront of our healthcare organizations. CMS has recently um, rolled out the a inpatient quality reporting measure. This measure is required um, for um, PBS hospitals. It is not yet required for critical access hospitals, but it's not something that we should overlook. Uh, you know, there has been some chatter about incorporating a health equity measure or something related to health equity into the critical access hospital and equip program. So uh, just something to keep in mind. But I think the uh, the measure itself speaks to what hospitals and healthcare organizations should really start to focus on. And it, and it sort of puts a nice perspective on some of the key components of um, advancing a hospital's commitment to, to health equity. Um, and so within this uh, inpatient quality reporting program measure, there are five different domains that a hospital has to meet. Uh, it starts with you know, strategic planning, data collection, data analytics, quality improvement, and leadership engagement. And so you know, there's uh, specific activities in each one of those domains that a hospital has to attest to. In addition, there's a uh, couple other measures that CMS has put out, again, for PPS hospitals, but again, 
something that we all should be thinking about from an operational um, perspective is around how we are capturing and screening for health-related social needs or those social determinants of health, um, such as you know, food insecurity, housing uh, instability, transportation needs, utilities, and interpersonal safety. Um, I think I was just reading an article not too long ago that you know um, today, even though that we've talked about the importance of uh, screening for social determinants of health, it still remains uh, such a a difficult or um, you know a process that has not been implemented at a lot of organizations where there's still that gap on. Uh, what mechanism we we do to screen and when do we screen for social determinants of health or how do we screen? How can we incorporate that into our practices? Um, so lots of variation, uh, even just around the screening aspect. And we'll talk a little bit more about how we can start to standardize and develop frameworks as it relates to data collection. Um, so just briefly, uh, a little bit more in depth about the two domains related to data. Um, that CMS has, has put out. Uh, domain number two is around data collection. And really what they're looking for is that a hospital um, collects demographic information, uh, including self-reported race and ethnicity and or different social determinants of health information um, on the majority of the patients. So if you think about some of the activities that you may be doing, you know, is this something that you know, you could check the box or you could attest to as a critical access hospital. Um, the second is our hospital has training for staff to in culturally sensitive collection of demographics and or social determinants of health information. Are we providing the necessary resources, education, coaching to our staff um, and supporting them in data collection because they are, you know, very foundational to really um, being a cornerstone of how we get that, that good data in um, uh, regarding our patients. And then our hospital inputs demographic or social determinants of health information collected into a structured interoperable data elements into a EHR technology. So do we, you know, we're not documenting things on paper. We're putting them into our medical record. Um, we're housing them in a place where we can then you know, next step, and I think the next slide that I have is we're able to pull that information out. We're able to start to stratify that information and do that data analysis to really be able to start to tell the story a bit more about our patient population of our organization and, and folks that are within our communities. The domain number three um, is around data analysis. Uh, so CMS uh, really would like a hospital to um, stratify key performance indicators by demographic or the social determinants of health variables to identify um, equity gaps and include this information on hospital performance dashboards. So I think this is um, a really great uh, kind of domain in this, uh, this particular area of focus is because not only are you stratifying that data and you're pulling it out and you're doing an analysis with it, but you're taking it another step and you're putting it onto a performance dashboard, um, a place where, you know, for a lot of, if you're um, on the quality side of, of your um, organization, you know, or even the finance folks, where you have a performance dashboard and you're constantly monitoring and um, moving towards goals and targets and monitoring that on a monthly or quarterly basis. So you're keeping it top of mind. You know, you're, you're all... Um, having these established targets and goals in mind and working towards that. So really, you know, highlighting the importance and, and incorporating some of that measurement culture around um, data analysis here. Also, I do want to just point out uh, Joint Commission for folks, any of you who are a Joint Commission hospital, uh, they also effective January 2023 this year. Um, they have uh, included uh, uh, the following elements of performance related to reducing healthcare disparities. And you can see, you know, very similar to the CMS um, uh, qu inpatient quality measures is around, you know, screening for social determinants of health, um, you know, stratifying quality and safety data. So again, very data collection, data, data analysis rich, um, and really as key components of supporting health equity strategies. 
and starting to really help to reduce and, and eliminate some of those healthcare disparities that we often are seeing. Um, and I, I do want to point out also, um, if folks are, you know, joint commission um, organizations, they have recently put out a accreditation, a health equity accreditation. Um, and so there is a, a process to go through that you can all get um, accredited for, you know, certain standards, meeting certain standards, very specific to health equity. So again, really at elevating the importance around um, health equity and really putting some standards um, in place. So how, what are some ways that we can start to think about using health um, equity data to understand community health? And, and what I'm going to walk through is really some of the foundational um, kind of aspects around uh, it, data collection and how we can kind of start to ask our data questions. Um, and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So um, also, we do want to just touch base that health data um, and understanding those health disparities um, that are within our communities is really supportive of um, IHI's triple aim. So really around the improving patient experience, improving the health of our populations, and starting to reduce the um, the cost of health care. Uh, and, you know, certainly, Again, querying data and looking at data from a race, ethnicity, language, sexual orientation, gender identity, religion, age, gender, you name it, um, looking at it from a geographic or zip code level or some other demographic social, social economic variable will really um, start to, to really identify some of those health disparities. Almost it's like it's, it's if you can continue to kind of dig a little bit deeper, it really starts to, to uncover where those um, uh, disparities exist. And, you know, what, what, you know, some of the examples is, you know, when we start to query different data sets, you may be looking at your own internal patient level data. Um, you may, you know, have a, a, a data set and you start to kind of query that data. And you may want to look at um, the Hispanic population with heart disease because you've noticed that or you've heard from state level data that our state has high rates of heart disease. Well, let's look at our, our own patient population um, and, and look at maybe can we stratify that data by race and ethnicity? And do we have higher rates of heart disease among our Hispanic population that utilize our healthcare services? Or maybe we want to look at high school education attainment um, and di diabetes management. Maybe we have an increase in our ED visits because of um, a mis you know, mismanagement of their diabetes medication. And we can tie that to education attainment levels. So maybe there is a gap in understanding how you know, one understands how they have to manage their health related to diabetes you know, and looking at those different levels of education and comparing that. Um, a third thing that we want, want to see or maybe recommend, if, if feasible, is to start to map in, in, you know, from a geography perspective or some type of visualization of your data. And I know that it may be hard for some organizations to kind of think about, oh, mapping data or um, creating some type of visualization. But when we do that, it really starts to represent the data um, a lot differently. It tells the story. It might highlight a geography or a neighborhood or something like that that ha may have a higher prevalence of a certain disease or, and, or maybe a, a vulnerable population that we had not really um, identified before, but now we can kind of see it from a mapping perspective or some type of visualization. So it just takes it to kind of another level um, for us to, again, kind of tell the story and look at the data a little bit differently. Um, you know, because we all can look at numbers on a sheet, but does it, how can we start to like resonate? How does this information really resonate um, and make it in, impactful? But with every good data set, there's also uh, barriers that come along with data collection and data use. Uh, certainly, um, we have 
uh, lots of different barriers, and I'm sure you all could add to this list um, of barriers that you've encountered as you've kind of got, start to go, go through this journey of, of looking and exploring um, data, health-related data. And, and certainly um, we have, you know, in, even at, at your local hospital level, there's a lack of standardization. Everyone's going to collect data a little bit differently. Um, some folks are, are not going to um, collect language categories, for instance. Um, but then some, some uh, organizations may have a robust set of data collection, and it's, and it's a complete data co uh, collection set. So again, there's a lot of lack of standardization and a lack of, um, um, uh, I would say, um, differences between how folks collect some of the data. Um, certainly, there's a lack of staff understanding of why data coll is collected, and we'll talk a little bit more about how we can minimize that, that um, understanding. And then um, certainly IT infrastructures that folks have, there's lots of limitations to the IT, whether it's your EHR and your ability to abstract information from or pull reports or um, even input some of the, the data. Uh, certainly, you know, you have sometimes you have fields that you can fill in, but then some places uh, folks are capturing um, uh, specific information in a free text. Well, you know, one thing that we can't do is when we download and pull data from our EHR, free text tends to not be something that we can easily pull and we can't analyze it. So it's, it's part of a missing data set. So it's incomplete. Um, so again, there's lots of IT uh, limitations and we have you know EHRs that don't talk but don't get me started <laughs> um and certainly there's a discomfort level about data collection uh you know staff ha having a comfort level to be able to ask patients um you know specific questions about their gender identity you know there may be a discomfort with with that and so again there could be that could impact your data collection and your accuracy of your data. Um, certainly patient privacy concerns, um, whether they are verbally um, giving answers to somebody at intake um, or are they uh, self-reporting them. You know, again, making sure that uh, the patient is feeling comfortable, but there are privacy concerns in which then may limit the amount of data that is collected. And then, you know, at the whole crux of it, we are rural. Um, rural, we tend to have smaller numbers. Uh, smaller numbers tend to skew the data a little bit more. And as um, our numbers get smaller, a lot of information is actually getting suppressed. And so we can't do anything about, you know, when some, some of the information that's coming out from CMS and looking at Medicare numbers, if is at a zip code level, if there is a low number of discharges, I think it's if it's below seven, they don't even give you the actual number. So we're getting incomplete data sets. Again, very problematic when we're trying to really advance and move the needle as it relates to um, really reducing some of these healthcare disparities. So what can we do? You know, certainly um, to kind of check the box on a standardization approach, is around um, implementing a data collection framework. And this um, is the American Hospital Association's Institute for Diversity and Inclusion. And it has a, a basically they have developed a framework for internal data collection. Um, and really, you know, if we have a systematic, um, you know, approach to collecting data from our patients and our, and our caregivers, um, our results of our data is going to be much more accu accurate and we're going to have a, a more complete data set. So uh, some of the things that are elements of the framework include um, having a rationale of why the patient is being asked to provide this information. So, you know, as an organization, we should have, you know, similar to maybe our collections policy or, you know, um, you know, paying at time of service and why, why do we have this rationale? I mean, very similar, not necessarily very similar, but again, having a rationale for why the patient is being asked. We need to have that internal, internally determined. Um, and so that's one for our staff and two for the patient. 
Um, having a script for staff. So, um, you know, and having a, a script for staff to so really support them um, in collecting some of this information. And then if using that script, so when they do ask the patient questions, it's done in a kind of a uniform fashion. So they, they aren't, you know, missing anything or they, um, you know, have the support of this script when they are maybe asking uncomfortable questions or that they may not be comfortable doing. They have that script to kind of come back to. Um, defining a method for allowing patients to self-report their information. So again, it goes back to that privacy barrier where they may not want to verbalize um, to you, you know, standing at the front desk uh, in waiting for, in, for intake um, some of this information. So it, can you, we do a paper form and we, you know, um, put that uh, information in electronically? Is there a tablet that they can self-report? You know, what is it that we can do to um, allow them to self-report their information? Um, and then how do we ensure that the data will be held confidentially? Certainly, you know, as folks just um, disclose more health-related information, they want to make sure that their data and their information is going to be held confidentially. Um, who has access to it very much um, is, a, a, you know, certainly a concern for some folks. And then um, when we move into that data kind of analysis um, work, you know, we want to make sure that we standardize an approach for rolling up um, the data that is collected. So, you know, looking at very specific um, categories using the um, um, U.S. Office of Management and Budget categories around race. So standardized approach around um, what, what we've determined for race categories as well as ethnicity. Again, uh, having a uniform framework really will help us with at more accurate and a complete data um, data set. So um, when we move into it, and then, you know, similarly, when we move into more of a data overall data infrastructure and start to talk about analytics, um, a organization's data infrastructure certainly needs to come from the top. You know, we need to have uh, strong leadership support to to really advance anything as it relates to data. And this, it doesn't need to even just be a focus on health equity, which is what we're talking about today, but for organizations to um, develop health equity, or, uh, sorry, data infrastructures, it needs to have leadership support. Um, and, you know, if we're going to move the needle as it relates to uh, data um, and, and start to make investments in this space, which there are many organizations that are really uh, moving quite quickly in this space and recognizing how important it is to develop this infrastructure. And, um, you know, so some organizations are really making investments around key um, uh, resources and, and even hiring staff that might be have backgrounds in, in analytics, predictive analytics, ACO analytics, um, uh, data warehousings, population health data. So again, um, making those investments in some resources or even just, you know, training folks um, and, and supporting folks internally if we, we aren't going to hire out. But again, um, having that commitment from leadership that we are going to really move in advance as it relates to building out a data infrastructure will support a lot of what we do in this health equity space around data collection and use. Um, making sure that we're supporting our staff, providing staff training um, on that data collection and of training, um, obtaining accurate data. Um, assess the accuracy of our data. So when we move into the data analytics part, we wanna make sure that um, the information that is coming in, the data that is collected is accurate. Um, so we can do some, there's different ways that operationally that we can do, what we can do to start to assess the data. We can think about um, validation sampling. So, you know, do you select a, a random sample of your patients for um, an additional interview or interaction? Um, and, you know, you talk to them about their 
um, self-identified race, religion, you know, um, in the different categories and then compare what was recorded. Uh, so you do you know, almost like a, a, or you can observe um, some of your patients and um, observe them on, on how, how well the patients are, are understanding what's being asked for them. So making sure um, that they um, are, are able to, we have set up a process in which they are able to uh, say, uh, share their information with us. Observe our staff too. Um, how well are the staff uh, presenting to the patient um, or requesting that patient level information from them? So again, if we build in this infrastructure, um, we are, we're going to be able to kind of set ourselves up to receive more complete and accurate data. Um, how do we characterize uh, missing data? You know, certainly we want to make sure that we do have complete data sets for sure, um, but we know we're in healthcare and things go missing or we do have um, incomplete data sets. And when we do have those missing, um, that missing information, or the validity of our data is can be um, uh, if you challenged, if you will, um, then certainly that's going to impact um, what we, you know, what comes out. You know, it's going to uh, stall our improvement efforts, or it's going to have an impact on um, uh, people questioning the data or the intent. So again, we want to make sure that we are. Um, uh, making sure there's no holes or gaps in, in our data. And then um, really articulating the reasons why for stratifying the data. You know, we were really, you know, we stratify the data because we're really looking to identify where the inequities exist in order to really target those improvement opportunities um, and reduce kind of the gap. And then really um, understanding from a de demographics perspective, um, you know, where, where some of those inequities exist demographically as well. So um, we've certainly, as, as healthcare organizations, we have multiple data sets. We have internal data, so utilization, clinical outcomes, social determinants of health, referral information. We have external data, or we have access to external data, and those might be your state health information exchanges. Certainly some states have really robust health information exchanges. Um, some, some need a little work. Um, and you also have access to different state or federal data sets. Uh, claims data, if you, you know, say if you are in an ACO, you receive claims data through your ACO. Again, all these different kind of data sets. Um, we like to say, utilize the data you have and get the data you need. Um, so really just important to know that there is, um, you know, lots of resources out there as it relates to data, um, lots of um, ways that you can access data from either if you're looking at it from a county level, state level, national level. Um, again, it's it, and again, looking at your state office of rural health for resources in regards to um, different data sets that that are available to you all. So again, um, lots of um, ways that you can compare your internal data with some of those external data sources. But when we start to um, get data for internally and externally, we really, um, really can start to understand the population and really understand where those um, uh, gaps in care are, stratify risk, start to engage our patient population, manage their care, measure the outcomes. Um, really and really using that data to understand our patient population. I do want to make sure that we point out that um, for uh, social determinants of health, ICD-10, we have the use of Z codes. Certainly encourage folks to use Z codes um, as appropriate uh, and, and make sure that we capture those Z codes on our, on our billing and coding. Um, not only is this something that goes onto our claims, it goes to our, our payer sources, it goes to the federal government, it goes to CMS. Um, and who does a lot of the federal funding and grant programs? Well, they utilize information that they can pull from claims data. 
And if we're not capturing claims level data information around, say, social determinants of health, leveraging these Z codes, then there likely is less focus on maybe these things that really impact uh, our communities and our, and our patient population. So um, again, not only do, is it good internal data, but it flows up. So it's gonna be something that uh, folks should, should make sure that we, we capture internally. Um, and then I talked a little bit about asking our data. So when we start to query our data, um, we are asking the data the right questions um, that will really start to give us insight into our patients, um, in our hospitals, in our, in our community. And so there's different ways to ask or query. Um, one is a process query, and that's really around treatment, procedure, and counter. So we may um, want to see what the percentage of male patients who had a colonoscopy by ethnicity uh, so very treatment procedure um, process query. Or we might want to see a, a percentage of patients with chronic health conditions who filled prescriptions by zip code. So again, um, you know, the, 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 the filled prescriptions, I, the process. Um, and then we also have on the other side, we have outcome query examples. So we may want to look at ethnicity breakdown of patients who suffered a fall during an inpatient stay or the, the breakdown of Hispanic patients hospitalized for COVID-19 by English speaking or non-English speaking. So again, asking your data the different questions um, will really start to give you some of those, those insights. And, um, you know, so what are some of the kind of key areas on identifying and understanding health inequities? One thing I do wanna point out is don't always rely on assumptions. Um, certainly, um, health inequities in our community may differ than national or state data, um, or even as surrounding communities. So we want to utilize the best available data that you have to understand what's happening locally in, in your communities. Um, and so uh, certainly don't just rely on, on, on what is assumed. And then also gain a comprehensive understanding about the identified health equities and examine multiple aspects of health in your community to get that clearer picture. So we really want to start to identify health risk behaviors and diseases according to some of those characteristics, you know, um, income, disability, um, and uh, gender identity, geography, race, ethnicity. Certainly, um, we want to get a, a better, clearer picture utilizing multiple aspects, not just to one, see if we can get multiple as aspects. Um, use appropriate to tools to identify um, health inequity. So leverage other national databases, uh, health departments, um, universities, and other hospital systems. Um, those are great examples of finding um, data related to maybe health outcomes, but then there's also organizations out there or um, that also have really robust data sets. For instance, public works, transportation, police departments, they also not only, do, they have their own internal data sources, different um, data sets that they collect that may be useful as you begin to explore your own data internally. Um, you may wanna look at crime statistics, for, in, for instance, um, again, looking at um, multiple sources, um, leveraging different tools to really help identify uh, some of those health inequities. Um, and also don't do it alone. Um, I can't stress this enough. And I think engaging community members in or partners in data collection and interpretation. Um, you know, we are, we're rural hospitals and critical access hospitals, we know folks wear multiple hats and do multiple different things and have lots of responsibilities and resources are generally um, tapped into a lot of the time. So if we are able to engage other folks in helping in support of data collection and interpretation, um, can we provide training to some community members to help them participate in data collection? Maybe it's um, uh, doing some walking around audits um, and, and then really start to kind of help them interpret some of the findings 
um, and engage them in, uh, you know, and maybe they have insights into the community uh, if they're, you know, really at community members and, and at the local level. So again, um, don't do this um, in, in a vacuum. And I think even if when we start to talk about strategy, um, you know, certainly community collaboration is at the cornerstone of, of building out and, and really being successful in a health equity strategy. So, um, and then lastly, you know, what gets measured gets improved. So bringing it all together, um, you know, and, and starting to, to touch on uh, a health equity strategy, I wanna point out, this is a journey. Um, and every organization is going to be somewhere different within this health equity journey. The American Hospital Association created this continuum here um, where healthcare organizations can really be anywhere across this continuum. You may have um, organizations uh, that are in the transforming phase. Um, basically, they're looking at how do we sustain um, our, our current kind of um, uh, what we're doing in this health equity space. Um, and so how are we sustaining? versus some organizations might be in that exploring phase. Um, and they're just kind of on trying to understand what are the resources that they need to really commit to this health equity journey. So believe me, everyone is at a different um, part of this, this continuum. And so don't get discouraged if you are uh, just kind of scratching your head of where to start. Um, there's, there's, plenty to do um, and just taking a step and acknowledging it certainly is is the first step. Um, and then some of the key things to really um, as we start to build out an overall health equity strategy, some key things to consider um, around kind of data collection for health equity, it's it's an ongoing process. Um, and so certainly looking at reassessing your data needs, modifying data collection methods if, if necessary, and certainly continuously defining and redefining your data collection and analysis process. Um, and then, you know, thinking about how you build all of this into the, your overall health equity strategy. <clears throat> so in conclusion, before we just open it up to any questions that folks may have, um, certainly COVID really pushed us into this um, and raised the public awareness around um, racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare. And certainly, um, you know, taking uh, data and looking at ways in which, you know, data is measured and stratified will really start to help organizations uncover some of those disparities. And really, then we can start to understand how we allocate and reallocate resources accordingly and really develop that uh, strategy for improving health equity um, among our rural communities. So with that, I'm gonna open it up for any questions that folks have. Hey, Lindsay, it's Hillary. Hey. Um, so I do have one question so far. Sure. Um, and this person has said, as a critical access hospital, we are data rich, but we don't know where to start. Um, what would you say would be the best way to start looking at our patient level data? Oh, great question. Um, so, you know, for, for nonprofit organizations, you have a community health needs assessment. I think that's a great way to start um, because that process of developing community health needs assessment, you do a lot of data collection and you start to scratch the surface on the needs of your community and your patient population. So I think um, starting there and, and really starting to look at also what are the objectives for our organization? You know, where does our hospital or um, want to want to address? What are, do we want to address health outcomes? Um, or do we want to address healthcare access? Or do we want to address social determinants of health? Like what do we want to focus on? So that kind of helps narrow um, the focus when you're thinking about looking at such a huge data set or a lot of data. Um, and then certainly um, making sure that your data is accurate. Uh, that's a good starting point too. And um, continue to cer certainly ask your data questions. You know, what do you want to see? You know, we, we looked at what are some of those queries of our data sets. So asking your data those questions um, are some good ways to start.
Great, thanks for that question. Well, um, I know we are right at time, so I do want to be respectful of time. Thank you all um, for joining today's um, conference. And we will have a survey just that will go out after this meeting ends. It will pop up on your uh, browser. So please, if you could have, some, it takes a moment um, to fill that out. Uh, that would be much appreciated. And again, um, thank you for attending today's uh, conference. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.